Good morning and welcome to St. Luke's. I'm Keith Ivonik. I'm your vestry on call this morning. A couple few announcements. Uh, this Saturday, late breaking news, uh, the first at 9 a.m. will be a cleanup outside, if you could please join us for that. Also, do not forget Bible study on Wednesday at 1 and Thursday at 6. Also, in your Inspire, you'll see that the uh, Clarkson Highway Department's having a pharmaceutical uh, deposit and collection. Uh, and that's uh, Tuesday from 3 to 4.30. Are there any other announcements today? Hi, I'm Brenda Trombley, the music director. You probably heard a few weeks ago that they announced that the monarch butterfly is now listed as endangered uh, because of uh, pesticides killing the milkweed that the birds or the butterflies need to feed on. There's another endangered species, especially here in Brockport, and that is the perch choir. <laughs> Especially coming out of the pandemic, I was invited to go across the street to the Presbyterian Church and their choir is completely dissolved now. They were about the same size as our choir before the pandemic and uh, they've just, you know, gotten older and tired of singing. So anyway, please come and help save our own beloved endangered species here at St. Luke's and join the choir. Our practices are on Wednesdays at 4 and we rehearse around 9.15 on Sunday mornings and if you think church is really interesting where you are right now, it is super interesting if you're sitting in the choir pews. And thank you. Where do I go after that? <laughs> Please join us in our celebration today. Thank you.
Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Lord be with you. Let us pray. O oh God, you declare your almighty power chiefly in showing mercy and pity. Grant us the fullness of your grace that we, running to obtain your promises, may become partakers of your heavenly treasure. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. A reading from the book of the prophet Jeremiah. The word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord in the tenth year of King Zedekiah of Judah, which was the eighteenth year of Nebuchadnezzar, at that time the army of the king of Babylon was besieging Jerusalem. And the prophet Jeremiah was confined in the court of the guard that was in the palace of the king of Judah, where King Zedekiah of Judah had confined him. Jeremiah said, The word of the Lord came to me. Hanimal, son of your uncle Shalom, is going to come to you and say, Buy my field that is at Anathoth, for the right of redemption by purchase is yours. Then my cousin Hannibal, Hannibal came to me in the court of the guard in accordance with the word of the Lord and said to me, Buy my field that is at Anathoth in the land of Benjamin, for the right of possession and redemption is yours. Buy it for yourself. Then I knew that this was the word of the Lord. And I bought the field of Anathal from my cousin Hanamel and weighed out the money to him, 17 shekels of silver. I signed the deed, sealed it, got witnesses, and weighed the money on scales. Then I took the sealed deed of the purchase containing the terms and conditions and the open copy, and I gave the deed of purchase to Baruch, son of Neriah, son of Messiah, in the presence of my cousin Hanimal, in the presence of the witnesses who signed the deed of purchase, and in the presence of all the Judeans who were sitting in the court of the guard. In their presence I charged Baruch, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, take these deeds, both the sealed deed of purchase and this open deed, and put them in an earthenware jar in order that they may last for a long time. 
For thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, houses and fields and vineyards shall again be bought in this land. The word of the Lord. A reading from the first letter to Timothy. There is great gain in godliness combined with contentment. For we brought nothing into the world so that we can take nothing out of it. But we have food and clothing. We will be content with these. But those who want to be rich fall into temptation and are trapped by many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of And in their eagerness to be rich, some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pains. But as for you, man of God, shun all this. Pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, and gentleness. Fight the good fight of the faith. Take hold of the eternal life in which you were called and for which you made good confession in the presence of many witnesses, in the presence of God who gives life to all things, and of Christ Jesus who in his testimony before Pontius Pilate made the good confession. I charge you to keep the commandment without spot or blame until the manifestation of our Lord Jesus Christ, which he will bring about at the right time. He who is the blessed and only sovereign, the King of kings, and Lord of Lords. It is he alone who is immortally and who is immortality and dwells in unapproachable light, which no one has ever seen or can see. To him be honor and eternal dominion. Amen. As for those who in the present age are rich, command them not to be haughty or to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but rather on God who richly provides them richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. They are to do good, to be rich in good works, generous and ready to share, thus storing up for themselves the treasure of a good foundation for the future, so that they may take hold of the life that really is life. The word of the Lord.
The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Luke. Jesus said to the Pharisees, There was a rich man who was dressed in purple and fine linen, and who feasted sumptuously every day. And at his gate lay a poor man named Lazarus, covered with sores, who longed to satisfy his hunger with what fell from the rich man's table. Even the dogs would come and lick his sores. The poor man died and was carried away by the angels to be with Abraham. The rich man also died and was buried. In Hades, where he was being tormented, he looked up and saw Abraham far away with Lazarus by his side. He called out, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am in agony in these flames. But Abraham said, Child, remember that during your lifetime you received your good things, and Lazarus in like manner received evil things. But now he is comforted here, and you are in agony. Besides all this, between you and us a great chasm has been fixed, so that those who might want to pass from here to you cannot do so, and no one can cross from there to us. He said, Then, Father, I beg you to send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers that he may warn them, so that they will not also come into this place of torment. Abraham replied, They have Moses and the prophets. They should listen to them. He said, No, Father Abraham, but if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. He said to him, If they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, neither will they be convinced, even if someone rises from the dead. The Gospel of the Lord. of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, the Gospel of Luke is not yet finished with relating parables told by Jesus that bring to light economic differences and how followers of Christ, or truly any faithful member of a uh, faithful worshiper of God, should behave in regards to the poor. We have a story of a rich man, and we're told he feasts sumptuously every day, that he dresses in purple and fine linen, and that his house has gates. All of these things are indicators of great wealth. To feast in the ancient world is to invite others and to then be hosted in their turn so that you would have this sort of back and forth exchange with your peers and you would try to sort of outdo one another in, in hosting and being gracious but win for yourself thereby much honor. At the home of a rich man would lay or would there would go the poor people, so that when the people who are coming in to feast arrive, they can give alms to the poor. This is another way in the ancient world that one could gain honor for oneself. If you are seen as being generous to the poor, then you gain great honor in the eyes of your community. We have in this parable a rich man who has all of this set up and yet fails to give anything to the poor, particularly this poor man who is uniquely named in the parables. Not many of the characters in parables get names, but this one does. His name is Lazarus. 
And scripture paints a very pitiable picture of him, indeed. Poor, ill, covered in sores, and starving. Starving to the point that he would be quite glad to take the scraps from the table of this wealthy man and thereby satisfy his hunger. The picture shows the extreme extremity of Lazarus' poverty, that he would be happy and satisfied with scraps. It also shows the extremity of this wealthy man's excess. There is enough left over to literally sustain other people, and yet it is simply tossed aside instead of taken to those poor and given to them to eat. This parable is consistent with much of the Gospel of Luke. We begin at the beginning of the Gospel with the Song of Mary, the Magnificat, that talks about the rich being sent away empty and the mighty being cast down from their thrones. There are parables over and over and over again throughout Luke that caution the wealthy and point out to them that a reversal is coming in this kingdom of God that Jesus is ushering in, when the poor will be lifted up and the wealthy will be brought low. And this parable shows that exact reversal in the afterlife that is, you know, fictionatively imagined here, where Lazarus is in a sort of heavenly realm and is comforted and well and happy and joyous. And the rich man who is reminded by Abraham, you already had all your good stuff, is suffering as a consequence for his failure to be generous with his wealth. So this economic slant on the scripture and this parable works very well. It's a very clear interpretation and application. And Jesus' audience certainly would have heard this as an admonishment to the wealthy to be generous with their goods and to look upon the poor not with derision and not to ignore them, but to help them and to see them, to respect their dignity, and to do what was really expected in that society to do. You take care of the poor. That's just what we do. There is another reading of this text. that I think it might be helpful for us to look at today. It's not in conflict with the original reading. It falls right into it. But it's a perspective that I find to be very rich in exploration for our own spiritual lives. In the ancient world, at these gates where we hear about Lazarus being deposited outside this rich man's house, there would often be benches. And it was customary for the poor, whether they could walk there or be taken there by someone else, to sit on these benches and by sitting there, place themselves in a posture of begging. It, was a, it, it signified that they were asking for alms to sit on this bench outside a rich person's home in the excavation of the city of Pompeii, which of course was destroyed by tons of volcanic ash in the year 79, I want to say, um, by Mount Vesuvius that uh, exploded or uh, erupted the volcano. The city of Pompeii was buried in ash, and a lot of it has been excavated since. And so you can see just the way things were as, as the city is revealed again the way it was at the time. And those benches outside of the fine homes are still there. You can see them. And as I imagine Lazarus sitting on this bench, a supplicant, waiting and hoping day after day after day, for these rich people walking in and out to give him something, I am reminded of this. Look down. Look to your right and to your left. 
we all sit upon a bench, when we come here week after week, we come to a bench where there is a feast and a banquet being prepared, and we come as supplicants. We come with our hands open and empty, hoping, trusting, and waiting that something will be put into them that will feed us, that will satisfy our hunger. Church pews did not even come into existence until the late Middle Ages. Before that, the nave of a church, this part of it, would have just been open space with perhaps a couple of benches for the elderly and infirm to sit down. Otherwise, everyone just stood. And this is a real equalizing posture where people from various backgrounds and various stations would mingle in this area as they worship. Toward the late Middle Ages, pews began to be introduced. And like many institutions in human history, they soon became a means of displaying one's status and one's wealth. They quickly changed from humble benches, often made of wood or stone, to elaborately constructed boxes, <laughs> right, with doors on them. You could go inside and sit in your own private box, just like at the theater, and you wouldn't have to mingle with anyone else. People who were extremely wealthy would hire their own architects and craftsmen to build these constructions in the nave of their local church. It would have their name on it. Some of them are still extant in Europe where there are paintings of the wealthy ancestors who commissioned these things right there where they would have sat. Talk about having your own pew. Your painting is literally right there <laughs> for all to see. The wealthy would have braziers in there and these giant, unheated, stone, drafty churches. You could have a brazier of hot coals and be quite comfortable as they receive communion and the comfort of worship. Well, of course, thankfully, the problem with this setup was eventually noted, but that this is not how we are invited to come and to worship. That these boxes, these means of separating based on wealth and material goods are directly antithetical to the scriptures that would have been being preached in those very churches. In the letter that Paul writes to the church at Corinth, he talks about not excluding the poor or the wealthy, you know, showing off their wealth in church gatherings, but rather to be sure that all are welcomed equally. And so over time, the church pew boxes began to fade away. In their place, we got pew rents. Even better, right? <laughs> you rent your pew, put your name on the end of it. That's one way to fund the church. <laughs> we can bring that back. <laughs> but eventually those fell away as well. And today, we have, as we see here, pews that are all alike, that are somewhat comfortable with their padding, but plain humble. And although I have a fairly good idea of whom to look for where, as I look out at you each Sunday, I know if I want to see certain folks, generally where to look. We don't own these pews. They don't belong to us in a way that something we've purchased with money does. Instead, we have a place on these pews because the host of our banquet says, come, come and sit. Come and be welcomed. And then come and be fed. So this morning, I don't know that it's really worth our time to 
exhort you all to be generous with your wealth. Y'all do that really well already. But I wonder if there is a need for all of us to examine the various forms of poverty with which we come into these pews. The deep chasms in our hearts that are yet empty. Illnesses or wounds that may or may not be a part of our physical bodies, but that affect the quality of our lives. Things for which we are hungry and we are hoping to be satisfied. If we could join Lazarus on the bench by the gate of that great and generous host, what might we receive at his generous hand? Because the host of this banquet is not like the rich man who looks over the heads of the poor and sees only his wealthy friends. The host of this banquet is the one who, when his friends were gathered for dinner, he took off his robe and he put a towel on his waist and he knelt down and washed their feet before breaking the bread at table with them and saying, take, eat, this is my body given for you. And sitting on these benches and coming to this table for a banquet, we don't need to hope against hope that we might merely be able to subsist on scraps. No. We can come here in confidence knowing that the very best will be given to us if we come with open hands and open hearts to receive it. Our collect this morning, the prayer at the beginning of our service, said, O oh God, whose power is chiefly displayed in showing mercy, reminds us that we come as supplicants. We come as people in need that that's okay, because Jesus meets us here and says, come, eat, be satisfied. Amen. Let us affirm our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty.
prayers of the people. Lord God, we pray for your holy Catholic Church. Grant that every member of the church may truly and humbly serve you. We pray for all bishops, priests, and deacons. We pray for all who govern and hold authority in the nations of the world. Give us grace to do your will in all that we undertake. Have compassion on the sick and those who suffer from any grief or trouble. Give to the departed eternal rest. We praise you for your saints who have entered into joy. Let us pray for your own needs and those of others, silently or aloud. Amen. Almighty God, to whom our needs are known before we ask, Help us to ask only what accords with your will, and those good things which we dare not or in our blindness cannot ask. Grant for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess. Almighty God, have mercy on you, forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. The peace of our Lord be always with you. Walk in love, as Christ loved us and gave himself for us, an offering and a sacrifice unto God.
and gracious Father, in your infinite love you made us for yourself. And when we had fallen into sin and become subject to evil and death, you in your mercy sent Jesus Christ, your only and eternal Son, to share our human nature, to live and die as one of us, to reconcile us to you, the God and Father of all. He stretched out his arms upon the cross and offered himself in obedience to your will, a perfect sacrifice for the whole world. On the night he was handed over to suffering and death, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread. And when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. We celebrate the memorial of our redemption, O Father, in this sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. Recalling his death, resurrection, and ascension, we offer you these gifts. Sanctify them by your Holy Spirit to be for your people the body and blood of your Son, the holy food and drink of new and unending life in him. Sanctify us also, that we may faithfully receive this holy sacrament and serve you in unity, constancy, and peace, and at the last day bring us with all your saints into the joy of your eternal kingdom. All this we ask through your Son, Jesus Christ, by him and with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will. gifts of God for the people of God. Take them in remembrance that Christ died for you and feed on him in your heart by faith with thanksgiving.
Eternal God, Heavenly Father, you have graciously Life is short, and we do not have much time to gladden the hearts of those who travel with us. So be quick to love and make haste to be kind. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you always. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord.